Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine on Channel's television. I'm Ladi Akiri Dunrali, the headlines. EU foreign ministers meet in Luxembourg to discuss ways to solve the food crisis caused by Russia's blockade of Ukrainian Black Sea harbors. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says he expects Russia to intensify attacks on Ukraine as Kiev awaits EU's decision on candidate status. And Speaker of Russia's Parliament says Ukraine is not suitable for EU membership. Today, European Union foreign ministers will meet in Luxembourg to discuss ways to free millions of tons of grain stock in Ukraine due to Russia's Black Sea port blockade at a meeting. Ukraine is one of the top wheat suppliers globally, but its grain shipments have stalled and more than 20 million tons have been trapped in silos since Russia invaded the country and blocked its ports. Moscow's uh, denied responsibility for the food crisis and blames Western sanctions for the shortage that has led to a jump in global food prices and warnings by the United Nations of hunger in poorer countries that rely heavily on imported grain. The EU supports efforts by the United Nations to broker a deal to resume Ukraine's seaports in a return for facilitating Russian food and fertilizer exports, but that would need Moscow's green light. Turkey has good relations with both Kiev and Moscow, and has said it is ready to take up a role within an observation mechanism based in Istanbul if there is a deal. However, it is unclear if the EU would get involved uh, militarily in securing uh, such a deal. Meanwhile, Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky has said that he expects Russia to intensify its attacks on his country, while Kiev awaits a European Union decision this week on granting Ukraine the status of a candidate country. Members of the bloc are expected to decide whether to award candidate status to Kiev uh, before Friday. The move would begin the process of Ukraine's accession to the alliance, which could take years to complete, but Mr. Zelensky warned the decision could see Russia step up its attacks. Speaking during his nightly address from Kiev, the Ukrainian leader said he and his advisors expect greater hostile activity from Moscow, but told citizens that his forces are preparing and are ready for any renewed assault. Obviously, this week we should expect from Russia an intensification of its hostile activities as an example, and not only against Ukraine, but also against other European countries. We are preparing, we are ready. Tomorrow begins a truly historic day, a week when we will hear the response of the European Union on Ukraine's candidate status. We've already got almost the positive decision of the European Commission. At the end of the new week, the response of the European Council is expected. Warning to the partners. The occupiers are accumulating forces in the Kharkiv direction, in the Zaporizhia region. They are shelling our fuel infrastructure again. They want to worsen the fuel situation. Of course, we will respond to this. Fierce fighting continues in the Donbass. The Russian army uses the most artillery there, the most of its offensive forces. But Severodonetsk and other hot spots are holding on. Our people are holding them. Our army is holding on. And I am grateful to everyone whose strength today is our victory tomorrow. And still on the EU's decision on Ukraine's membership status, the head of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has expressed confidence that Ukraine will be granted an official candidate status. Mrs. von der Leyen told German broadcaster ARD yesterday that she firmly believes that the bloc will get a positive decision and support, added that she was confident of Ukrainian prospects. Mrs. von der Leyen's comments come after the EU Commission on Friday came out in favor of formally designating Ukraine and Moldova as candidates to join the European Union. And in reaction to that, the Speaker of Russia's Parliament has said Ukraine is by no means 
a suitable candidate for European Union membership. Vyacheslav Volodin wrote on Telegram saying total corruption, rampant crime, oligarchic power, and a ruined economy are the characteristics of modern Ukraine. Europe understands this very well too, but the desire to weaken Russia prevails. Mr. Volodin said the 27-nation union was ready to give Ukraine candidate status because Washington and Brussels want to keep the hostilities going. He added that the result for Ukraine will be sad. The decision-making center will be officially transferred to Brussels and it will finally lose its independence. And German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has said that Angela Merkel's policy of maintaining good relations with Moscow during her tenure as the German Chancellor was by no means wrong. He admitted, though, that he considered Germany's over-reliance on Russian energy supply to be a mistake. When asked if Germany was too friendly to Russia under Merkel, Mr. Scholz defended his predecessor's position by saying that his own stance on the issue was close to hers. Mr. Scholz, who was finance minister and vice chancellor in Mrs. Merkel's fourth and last government, still criticized Germany's energy policy, which had been too heavily reliant on Russian supplies. He said, it was a mistake of the German economic policy that we focused too much on our energy supply from Russia without building the necessary infrastructure so that we could have reorganized supplies quickly if the worst came to the worst. Ukraine's Prosecutor General's Office says 323 children have died amidst the war and 586 have been injured. The office said an eight-year-old girl was wounded as a result of shelling in Genesk's village of Zelitsnolia yesterday. The office added that another two children, aged 13 and 14, received shrapnel wounds when a shell fell into a pond they were swimming in in the Kharkiv region on the same day. What was intended as a 10-day vacation in a sunny Egyptian Red Sea uh, resort for Ukrainian manager Alexander Golovkin and his family has lasted more than 100 days, placing uh, the now refugees under uncertainty with the war in their country dragging on. Mr. Golovkin and his family first traveled to Marsa Alam to spend their annual holiday 10 days before Russia invaded Ukraine in February in an expensive that has so far killed thousands, uprooted millions and reduced cities to rubble. Now they are renting an apartment in Sham al-Sheikh with their Russian friend and her daughter and have become part of a small community of Ukrainians stuck in the resort city. The trip was scheduled to end on the same day that the war started. With the news of the invasion, which Russia calls a special operation, the two families knew that going back to their hometown in Kharkiv would be delayed. Mr. Golovkin now depends on his savings and some remote work to support his family after he renewed his tourism visa in Egypt. Ukraine's ambassador to Cairo said in February that up to 20,000 Ukrainian tourists in Egypt had been stranded by the conflict, mostly at resorts on the Red Sea. Egypt had allowed Ukrainians to stay in three-star hotels for free as long as they need when the war started. And Ukrainians say the country has facilitated the extension of tourism visas for those who stay behind. Oh, you know, first it was a small uh, meeting. It was uh, around uh, seven people in my backyard. And from that moment, we start to, start to call this place uh, like uh, Embassy of Ukraine in Sharm el Sheikh. <laughs> Um, we had a flex. First of all, we uh, make the flex. You know, the, the, the feeling when you keep it, when you hold it, makes you very strong and very nice and very warm. At the first meeting we organized, it was the Easter. Uh, for us, it was a special day because that uh, time, it was 24 uh, March, and it was the first month of the war. And uh, we can believe, actually, that it's happening, you know. It was very strange emotions and very strange feelings. Uh, we gathered together, we sing the song. Uh, the priest in the Catholic church here in Hayanur, he welcomed us in this uh, uh, church. And we feel very much warm. we crying together, we uh, hugging together, we singing together, and we pray for victory of Ukraine. Russia has claimed its long-distance sea-based missiles destroyed a command post of Ukrainian troops, killing more than 50 generals and officers 
while the Ukrainian side said the situation in several Donetsk is difficult but manageable. Igor Konashenko, spokesman of the Russian Defense Ministry in a video, said Russian Federation Armed Forces have continued launching attacks at military facilities located in Ukraine. The attacks have resulted in eliminating more than 50 generals and officers of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, including those of the general staff, the Kakova Group, airborne assault troops, and units that operate towards Nikolaev and Zaporizhzhia. Russia's news agency, RIA, quoted the Luhansk Armed Forces, are saying that the Ukrainian troops trapped at the Azot chemical plant in Severodonetsk Donetsk are still resistant, but they also express the willingness to negotiate. From the Ukrainian side, according to reports by the Ukraine National News Agency, an advisor of Ukrainian Internal Affairs Minister Denis Monostrysky says the situation in the eastern front of Ukraine is difficult, especially in the direction of Severodonetsk, but the situation is still under control. Irina uh, Yarovaya, deputy chairwoman of the Russian state at Duma, has said that the United States has deprived Ukraine of its sovereignty by establishing secret biological laboratories in the country. She said the fact that the U.S. did not involve Ukraine in the work of these clandestine labs or share any of the lab's research showed that Ukraine and other unnamed countries where similar labs had been allegedly set up have been stripped of their sovereignty. Ms. Yarovaya says the U.S. had a long history of trying to access military biotechnology and said U.S. military personnel had obtained research results from inhumane experiments conducted by Japanese Army units 731 and 100 during World War II and pardoned the Army and scientific personnel behind these war crimes in its bid to develop its own biological and uh, chemical weapons. Russia's state news agency TASS says two top commanders uh, of fighters who defended the Azovstal steel plant in Ukraine's southeastern port of Maripol have been transferred to Russia for investigation. Uncertainty has surrounded the fate of hundreds of fighters captured by Russian forces in May after a month-long siege of Maripol. Uh, Moscow says at the time they were moved to breakaway Russian-based entities in eastern Ukraine. Citing an unnamed Russian law enforcement source, Taz says that Sivetslav Paloma, a deputy commander of the Azov Battalion, and Sergei Volonitsky, the commander of the 36th Marine Brigade of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, were moved to Russia. They had been transferred by special forces officers from Donetsk, an eastern Ukrainian province that Moscow recognizes as a pro-Russian republic to conduct investigative activities uh, against them. Let's talk now to Professor David Awurawo, who is a professor and head of Department of History and Strategic Studies at the University of Lagos, who joins us uh, virtually. Good morning to you, Prof. Thank you for your time this morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. It looks like uh, things are moving after it looked like there was a stalemate, but things now seem to be moving uh, fairly fast particularly on uh, the diplomatic, if we look at it that way, uh, front. Uh, Ukraine is likely to become a candidate for the European uh, Union membership uh, this week, but that does not mean it will become a member of the EU for weeks or months or possibly even years from now. But the whole thing was not about Ukraine joining the EU, was it? It was about Ukraine joining NATO. So why is this seemingly uh, in the news, uh, because this was not the reason why uh, all of this started in the first place. Um, yes, um, the, the uh, Ukraine has uh, leaned towards the West, you know, in the past uh, couple of years. And uh, in leaning towards the West, um, there has been the desire to join uh, the EU, and also uh, to join NATO. Um, so uh, the the the, the uh, you know uh, the interest of Ukraine is in joining the two world bodies uh, or the two regional bodies. One NATO, the military; the other 
uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, a more a broader uh, uh, organization. I mean, with, with uh, its objectives that are broader. Um, EU has a set of criteria that countries must meet to be able to join. NATO has, you know, a set of criteria as well that countries must uh, fulfill, you know, for them to join. Uh, when one looks at the structure of, uh, of the EU and then the structure of Russia, the internal structure of Russia, it seems that it will be easier for uh, Ukraine to be able to, you know, uh, join EU than NATO. For instance, one of the requirements of uh, um, NATO membership is that uh, a country will not have, um, you know, a structure of uh, separatist and, uh, you know, similar security uh, complications. Uh, Ukraine has that. And so, and it doesn't seem that it is something that will be resolved anytime soon. Of course, we know what, what, what is happening in Crimea and what is happening in Donbass uh, you know, region where uh, Russian-backed separatists are fighting. With that kind of structure, you know, it will be difficult for um, uh, Ukraine to be able to, access, I mean, to join uh, NATO. Uh, it will take a long time for those things to be sorted out for Ukraine to qualify to join NATO. But for the EU, it will be a lot easier because, uh, you know, the conditions are, you know, um, uh, a lot more uh, flexible, so to speak. Even then, it is not something that took place in a few weeks or even a few months. Uh, it takes a long, 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 long time uh, for countries to be assessed and reassessed and reassessed to be able to join uh, this body. So um, it, it, is, it is work in progress, but it's not something that is going to take place, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the shortest possible time. It's something that will take years first to be able to join EU and then even more complicated to be able to join NATO, which is why uh, we have consistently said that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a strategic blunder because Ukraine was never going to be able to join NATO anytime soon. And mm -hmm. Russia had other avenues to be able to, you know, uh, pursue its objectives, uh, you know, within the, the region and uh, within the international system. But tragically, Russia started this war and we have seen the tragic consequences on Russia, on Ukraine, and indeed, the entire international community. I'm happy you mentioned that, which brings me to my next question, uh, talking about um, peace talks. Uh, there, there were peace talks near the start of this conflict, and uh, those weren't ultimately successful, and there were those who pointed out that, well, perhaps each side wanted to see how much ground they could gain so that when they come to the negotiating table, they have some leverage. Now, uh, we, are, we are in week 16 now, uh, of this uh, situation, and um, do you think either side has gained real leverage, uh, so to speak, and that some of those who have backed Ukraine all along are now talking about Ukraine fatigue? That is, uh, they're asking members of the Western Alliance to guard against that, that because this is going to be a long fight. Uh, we heard from the NATO uh, Secretary General, we heard from uh, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and we heard from a number of other uh, European leaders who are warning that this is not about to end anytime soon, that so they should prepare themselves for the long haul in backing Ukraine in this crisis. Do, do you see now a balance for there to be peace talks, or is this likely to grind on as war? Well, um, what I foresee is in line with what um, the EU and NATO, uh, the, you know, the European countries have, uh, you know, uh, indicated. And that is that the um, Russia-Ukraine war will drag on for a long, long time. Uh, it will drag on for months. Let's hope it doesn't drag on for years. Mm -hmm. The reason is that there is now a stalemate. The support that the West has given to Ukraine has enabled Ukraine to hold on firmly such that the quick victory that Russia envisioned has not taken place. Of course, Russia has its own uh, limitations as well. You know, uh, the calculations it made uh, were not correct in several respects, and that has impacted on their inability to quickly defeat Ukraine 
and uh, you know uh, uh, fulfill the objectives in the war. But as the war dragged on, I mean, it was soon before four months in, uh, in in three four days time. Um, as the war dragged on, <laughs> and Western support given to Ukraine, yeah, you know, it has now enabled uh, Ukraine to be able to hold on more firmly against Russia. That is why the war will likely drag on for many months, if not years, as the EU and European countries have uh, have indicated. But what we have you know, recommended all this while is, um, you know, a diplomatic, a firm and robust diplomatic engagement that will lead to, you know, uh, a quick resolution of the conflict. Uh, when the war started, it started as something like a zero-sum game. And when um, the, the casus belli of a war, uh, the, the underlying issues are zero-sum, it is usually difficult to resolve, which means once again, is the loss of the other. It's either uh, Ukraine will join NATO and Russia will be disadvantaged, or Ukraine will not, and Ukraine will be disadvantaged. But as things have unfolded, it is clear that some negotiation can take place to reassure Russia and also guarantee the security of Ukraine. That is what diplomatic efforts in the next couple of days and weeks should focus on. What will Russia concede? And what will Ukraine concede? So that there will be, you know, reassurance on both sides, and then build confidence, you know, to be able to lead to a resolution and an end to the conflict. It is very obvious now that the conflict has benefited no, no one. It hasn't benefited Russia. It hasn't benefited Ukraine. It hasn't benefited the international community. So much resources have been, you know, frittered away, you know, uh, to prosecuting the war. And at the end of the day, like I said before, these the objectives that Russia sought to, you know, achieve at the beginning could have been achieved without recourse to violence. So the war will drag on, but at the end of the day, we hope that diplomacy will gain momentum so that the violent conflict can come to an end. I, I, I can't let you go without asking about uh, the issue of the international community, which you have mentioned twice in your last two answers. It does look like uh, outside of the EU, outside of NATO, outside uh, uh, of Ukraine and Russia, everybody else is acting as spectators. It's like we're sitting at ringside or in the stands at the stadium and watching all of this unfold, except for the fact that we're also being impacted. Uh, stock markets are down, uh, food uh, prices are up, inflation is up in every country. Uh, why are we victims of unintended consequences, yet we are able to play little role in resolving the crisis that has led to these consequences? Uh, well, um, incidentally, that is how the international system is structured. Um, you have um, the superpowers, uh, referred to also as the major powers. You also have the great, uh, you know, the great powers uh, who are at the forefront of uh, you know resolving international conflict. <laughs> if if you take a look at uh, the whole thing, you see that the United Nations itself that has uh, about two hundred members, the Security Council has only five permanent members, and then fifteen in all. You know other non permanent members joining, but those that call the shots are just the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. Of course, those are also the. Um, um, major powers and the great powers. So that is how the international system is structured. It is structured that in such a way that it is those countries that are strong, that have the wherewithal to shape the world in their mode, mm -hmm. that are also able to you know, contribute uh, tremendously to how international conflicts are resolved. So it is in line with the structure of the international system. What has been most disappointing in all of this is the United Nations. Indeed, NATO, the EU, and individual European countries and the US on their own have been far more you know, um, um, effective in shaping the war one way or the other than the United Nations. It is so, so disappointing that the United Nations, which is the organ that promotes the international peace and security, has been in total somnolence. It is asleep in the war, in the world, and, uh, you know, uh, in efforts to resolve the, 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 the conflict. But it is in, in international conflicts, it is the major powers 
and the great powers that uh, you know shape the course of things. And uh, we are not surprised that even though we are all impacted uh, negatively mostly, um, only a few countries are able to you know get involved to try to uh, take actions and measures to resolve the conflict. Indeed, uh, Professor David Awara, thank you so much for your time and perspective this morning. It's been a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you very much. After the break, Ukraine to ban music by some Russians in media and uh, public spaces. Please join us again. Thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back. Ukraine's parliament has voted in favor of banning some Russian music in media and public spaces. The ban will not apply to all Russian music, however, but rather relates to music created or performed by those who are or were Russian citizens after 1991. Artists who have condemned Russia's war in Ukraine can apply for an exemption from uh, the ban. The import of books from Russia and Belarus will also be prohibited under the legislation. The bill approved by members of parliament bans some Russian music from being played or performed on television, radio, schools, public transport, hotels, restaurants, uh, cinemas, and other public uh, spaces. It secured support from 303 of the 450 deputies in the Ukrainian parliament. The ban will apply to musicians who have or had Russian citizenship uh, any time after 1991, the year Ukraine declared independence, except for those who are Ukrainian citizens or were so at the time of their death. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said that Ukraine can and should host the 2023 Eurovision Song Contest after the organizers said they were in talks to hold it in Britain instead due to the war. Speaking to journalists after returning from uh, Kiev's capital, uh, from Ukraine's capital, Kiev, over the weekend, Boris Johnson said the streets there were lively and Ukrainians were confident. While decades-long tradition dictates that the winner of the contest gets to host it the following year, Organizers say the security guarantees required to hold the competition in Ukraine meant discussions would be held with the runner-up, Britain. Ukrainian Arab folk band Kalush Orchestra, who were given special permission to leave their country to compete, soared to first place with 631 points in a symbolic show of public support following Russia's invasion. The Ukrainians won the, the Eurovision Song Contest. I know we had a fantastic entry. I know we came second. And I'd love it to be in this country. I'd, of course, I'd love it to be in this country. But the fact is, they won. And they deserve to have it. And I believe that uh, they can have it. And I believe that they should have it. And I believe that Kiev uh, or, it, or any other safe uh, Ukrainian city would be a fantastic place to have it. And I very, very much hope that, is it the European Broadcasting Union? I hope the European Broadcasting Union uh, will recognize that because I don't think it's right. This thing's a year away. It's a year away. It's going to be fine uh, by the time the Eurovision Song Contest comes around, and I hope that the Ukrainians get it because they deserve it. Let's talk uh, to Juliana Olainka, our correspondent in London, who is in our London studios this morning about this and other uh, developments surrounding the Prime Minister's uh, trip to Ukraine. Uh, good morning to you, Juliana. Good morning, Laddie. Let, let's start off, of course, with uh, uh, this Eurovision Song Contest. Uh, the Prime Minister uh, seems to think that definitely a year from now, uh, this conflict in Ukraine will be over, and therefore uh, Ukraine should host it. But his country is also in talks uh, with the European broadcasters uh, as runner-up uh, to host the tournament, uh, this competition next year. How is that going down? What, what do we know about that? And are there any other reactions uh, that you can tell us about it with respect uh, to this issue?
Well, not really, no. I think uh, a lot of what uh, was just said in that clip by the Prime Minister there has been echoed uh, by individuals up and down the United Kingdom. The Eurovision Song Contest, some would call it a joke competition, but it's certainly a part and parcel of European culture. Um, everybody um, uh, speaks about it the day after people tweet through it. Um, it has been um, a, a kind of joke a competition, but of course it got a little bit serious uh, during uh, the last session because, of course, um, Europe is in the middle of the war and Ukraine uh, were the worthy uh, winners. And President Vladimir Zelensky said that he did want to use uh, the competition next year um, as a sign and a showing to Russia that Ukraine and Kiev is back up and running. Uh, but the reality is that just may not be the case. Um, it is a huge contest. And not only, of course, do we have all of uh, the finalists who will be singing on the day. They also have their own team. There's a huge technical staff. Um, I believe it probably takes about nine months of preparation. And the European Broadcasting Union are trying to do that. They are looking at the situation. And it is just not possible at this present moment uh, to host it in Ukraine, even when uh, we do have some pretty high-profile names, uh, such as the UN Secretary General, the leaders that were there last week, um, going to Kiev, um, it is incredibly difficult to make sure uh, that they are secured. It takes a lot of security, lots of hush-hush and whispering just to make sure uh, that the trip can be uh, safe. But if you think that tens of thousands of individuals, as well as thousands of competitors, uh, will be able to go to uh, Ukraine and Kiev and make sure the contest uh, goes off uh, without any uh, security issue, that is going to be the problem. But in terms of uh, Britain, uh, Britain came for the first time in a very long time, um, a, a, a comfortable second place. Uh, the BBC and the EBU would prefer Britain to host it. Uh, there are some cities outside of the capital, like Manchester and Birmingham, uh, that, that, that are desperate to host um, an event such as this. But we'll just have to wait and see. At this present moment, it's just not safe for the competition uh, to take place there. And whether or not the EBU and the BBC will decide to put preps on hold to see how this war uh, uh, it, it takes place, it um, shapes up over the next coming months. We'll just have to wait and see. Well, f to something far more serious, and you did uh, allude to it in your last answer there where you mentioned hush-hush. Uh, something that was quite hush-hush was the Prime Minister's visit to Kiev uh, last week. In fact, he, he was uh, uh, expected in Doncaster to speak to uh, uh, another MPs uh, of, the Tor uh, of the Conservative Party and then he was a no-show, and the next thing was that he was in Kiev visiting with Vladimir uh, Zelensky. Now, that has political implications because those northern MPs were part of the MPs that were elected and gave Boris Johnson's government the comfortable majority he has in parliament. So politically, they're very important. And there are two by-elections uh, coming up, one in uh, uh, Wakefield, uh, and uh, the other, I believe, uh, uh, I, I'm trying to get the name of the second place, it's two names combined now, uh, that are going to take place. That's so, was it a mistake? How is that coming out? Exactly, thank you. Uh, uh, how is that playing out, especially with those MPs feeling that they were snubbed by the Prime Minister when he flew off to Kiev? You're right. I think, uh, you know, Boris Johnson's unannounced visit to Kiev uh, was highly politicised. I don't think it went down too well um, amongst uh, backbench MPs as well as uh, people across Britain. I think um, in terms of the importance of going to Ukraine, of course, that is important. It's, it's very important that Western allies uh, show uh, solidarity uh, to Zelensky and this ongoing bombardment. But we already had a pretty high profile visit, didn't we? Just a couple of days before. The leaders of France, Germany and Italy were there. Um, the fact that uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson uh, shows up a couple of days later, not really with any kind of big announcement. He did say yes, that there is going to be uh, this uh, uh, quite a large scale uh, a training scheme which he hopes to launch, where I believe within every 120 days they hope to uh, uh, train up to 10,000 Ukrainian soldiers. That's great. Is that not something that could have perhaps been announced in Parliament? 
government? Is that not something that could have been um, announced via a video conference phone call? I think people would say yes, um, because he has a lot of mess to clear up. We've got the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting taking place in Kigali later uh, on this week. Uh, of course, we know that Rwanda has been absolutely trashed um, in the British media. Um, you know, talks of migrants wanting to kill themselves rather than, uh, you know, start a new life um, in Africa hasn't been great for him. Yes, the Prime Minister did manage to survive the vote of confidence um, and the Partygate scandal, but there are two by-elections. These elections are taking place in, on Thursday. There is a possibility uh, that the Conservatives could lose uh, two seats. One is a Red Bull seat, uh, one is uh, supposed to be a safe Conservative seat. Uh, but the Prime Minister uh, seems to be dodging uh, speaking to any of the 148 MPs uh, that voted against him. Um, there is the cost of living crisis, which we've been discussing extensively on channels. This week, the rail network is going to come to a complete standstill. Uh, millions of people are being asked uh, to work from home. We know that Brexit is having a huge impact um, on uh, travel at the moment. So th there's a lot of domestic mess. And I think uh, the Conservative Party have, have tried to create this strategy of any time uh, the Prime Minister mentions Ukraine or stands next to the world's most popular man at the moment, Vladimir Zelensky, it makes his stock go up. And the last time, the first time he did it, I think it did. Uh, but this time, I think people like, you know, there's lots more to do in your own backyard uh, rather than trying to use uh, Vladimir uh, to gain uh, some international or national respect. I, I just don't think it went down well for them. Uh, but the prime minister has a very, very important week. So who knows uh, whether he is going to survive um, in the next coming fortnight. But there are lots of discussions um, that uh, he needs to prioritise rather than uh, the ongoing war in Ukraine. There, there is a scheme, though, uh, that, that has just been, uh, it was experimented with, and it's been expanded now to cover about 20,000 households, where it is possible, because of the cost of leaving uh, 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 issue that you mentioned, that, that those, that scheme allows people to actually borrow money uh, at virtually no interest rates. Uh, these are people who would ordinarily not qualify for loans, uh, under uh, a normal commercial transactions uh, because of their credit ratings and all of that. Uh, again, given what we've talked about already about attempts to detract or take the attention away uh, from party gates and all the other things uh, that he ordinarily would have been dealing with, the Ukraine crisis, this presents him a good opportunity to talk about something that is positive. If people can get money uh, at next to no cost to them. That might buy him some good, good points, brownie points, perhaps. Yes, I, perhaps, perhaps it will. I think, uh, you know, you, you'd have to, you'd, you'd have to really dig to try and find anybody that's going to support um, the Prime Minister or the Chancellor's um, uh, strategy in dealing with the cost of living crisis. Um, it, it, the, the Prime Minister and uh, the Chancellor were under immense pressure uh, from uh, the Labour Party, from some backbenchers, as well as charities, to try um, and, uh, you know, uh, have a mini budget or try to extend uh, some of uh, the uh, support to vulnerable households. We know that um, I believe 8 million households who receive a universal credit will be receiving an extra £650, £324 uh, they'll be receiving next month. But is it enough? I don't think it is enough. It's certainly not going to be enough um, to try and um, alleviate some of the, 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 the I would say, anger that these Tory MPs have towards uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Lots of people have been talking about um, this iceberg uh, where the 148 um, MPs are just the tip of that iceberg. Um, as soon as uh, we find out the results of the by-elections on Thursday, I'm sure uh, some of those uh, MPs on the front bench that have been smiling through gritted teeth may stop some of those supportive tweets and may start uh, questioning whether or not uh, the Prime Minister is fit uh, to leave 
need this country. I think as well, a lot of people have been, you know, uh, giving uh, Boris Johnson a round of applause and saying, great, you have been wonderful uh, during this Ukraine crisis. But I think there are only a very small amount of people that believe the hype that Boris Johnson has been leading uh, the Western Front. I think uh, European leaders certainly don't feel that they are following in um, Britain's footsteps. They believe that they're taking the lead. And in fact, if you think of what the most critical issue is now coming out of Ukraine, it is the 8 million plus individuals that have fled Ukraine. Where are they fleeing to? They're certainly not fleeing to Britain. And they're not able to do that because we know that we have a hugely uh, bureaucratic, which is a nice way to put it, system in place where there are checks and balances. In fact, there are some Ukrainian children uh, that have come into uh, the United Kingdom that have been sent back to Ukraine because they do not have the uh, sufficient paperwork that the Home Secretary needs. And so it's all a little bit of a mess right now. I think uh, the comms department um, in Whitehall are pretty busy uh, trying to make sure they keep Boris Johnson out of trouble and in uh, a popular spotlight. And perhaps, you know, uh, being a strong ally to Vladimir Zelensky is what they think is going to be enough uh, to get him through what is likely to be a very crucial uh, fortnight. But let's wait and see. Like I said, we've got millions of people working from home this week because of the rail strikes. We've got tens of thousands of people uh, queuing um, and uh, missing out on going to dream holidays because of the mess in um, the airport. And then we also have the issue with Rwanda. And the prime minister is not going to be able to hide behind a dispatch box when he's in front of African leaders. And he has to answer why uh, some um, uh, British media are putting tones of xenophobia when they're talking about people, uh, you know, starting new lives in Africa. And so I think Ukraine is certainly at the bottom of uh, the, the, the list of the things that uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson needs to sort out this week. Indeed, indeed, Juliana. Uh, 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 of course, uh, we'll be keeping close eyes uh, on, on the developments from uh, those two by-elections and how uh, uh, Ukraine and the issues coming out of Ukraine, as well as the Rwandan uh, asylum situation, uh, uh, have uh, impact on, on those two by-elections and the results and how that affects uh, Boris Johnson's uh, premiership with you all through this week. But for now, it's just enough to say thank you. Thank you for your time this morning, Juliana. Have a pleasant day ahead. Train strikes or no train strikes. Thank you, Ladi. Russian gas giant Gazprom has said that the gas delivery via both lines of the Turk Stream pipeline will be suspended from June 21 to 28 due to the annual maintenance work. The Turk Stream pipeline project consists of two parallel pipelines that run from Russia to Kikoi, a city in northwest of Turkey via the Black Sea. From Kirkor, Russian gas is delivered to Turkey as well as to southern and southeastern Europe through Turkish territory. Its design capacity is 31.5 billion cubic meters of gas uh, per year. And still uh, to come, it's not great news for Russian world number one, Daniel Medvedev, as he continues his losing streak at the ATP Grass Court Tournament. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us. Budapest's foreign minister said that Russia has promised to continue gas shipments to Hungary and that Moscow's state energy giant Gazprom would fulfill its contractual obligations to the country. Peter Siyato said that Gazprom CEO Alexei Miller and Russia's deputy prime minister Alexander Novak had both assured him of this in a phone call. Under a deal with Gazprom signed last year, Hungary received 3.5 billion cubic meters of gas per year via Bulgaria and Serbia under its long-term deal with Russia and a further BCM via a pipeline from Austria. In response to Western sanctions imposed on Moscow since its invasion of Ukraine, Gazprom has cut supplies to Denmark's Austed and to Shell's Energy for its contract to supply gas to Germany. It has also caught supplies to Dutch gas trader Gestera, along with Bulgaria, Poland and Finland for refusing to make payments for Russian gas in rubles under a new ruble a scheme. Germany will restart coal-fired power plants and offer incentives for companies to curb natural gas consumption, marking a new step in the economic war between Europe and Russia. 
Berlin unveiled the measures uh, yesterday after Russia cut gas supplies to Europe last week as it punched back against European sanctions and military support for Ukraine. Now let's talk about this and other business outcomes uh, with Laddie Williams of our business. This morning, Laddie. Right, morning. Uh, today, I want to start off from home. Right. Uh, we're going to come back to Germany in just a moment, but something I read this morning caught my eye, which right. is that last week, the Nigerian stock market lost 767 billion right naira. yes it was uh, it, it, was that a typo or, um, or it was real that, that was uh, the actual figure and investors felt the impact of that and uh, at the end of the day it was it's a shortened uh, trading week but it was all red i reported the stock indeed market last i remember week. that on friday <laughs> i remember that you saying four days exactly four red bills Exactly. And I was expecting at least maybe the last day of trading should be at least uh, maybe we'll see some bargain hunting and maybe close the week in the green. But that did not happen. We saw the market lose uh, about 2.86%. You know, that's the all talking about the all share uh, index. And it's, it's actually expected because at the end of the day, when inflation is rising and you're seeing uh, uh, central bankers get hawkish, we know risk assets are going to get hit. And we saw that happen right here, you know, in the Nigerian exchange. We saw traders, you know, have major uh, sell-offs at this point because we're seeing that risky assets are getting, you know, more risky at this time. We're seeing sell-offs in the global equity space and, you know, Nigeria is not, you know, left out left of that. that. And yeah. we also, you know, see a, a deep pockets, you know, uh, investors actually selling off for... Fleeing. Uh, uh, fleeing, you know, for their... Uh, personal reasons, some of them maybe to fund the elections and, you know, all of that. And we saw, you know, sell-offs in stocks like MTN, Airtel, most of the banking stocks were sold off massively. Very badly. Very hit. badly. The, the banking counter was down about 5% for the week, you know, last week. But it's a new uh, trading week. Uh, hopefully, the bears don't continue, <laughs> don't continue know, their dominance into this week. But at the end of the day, Risk assets are not looking uh, pretty good at this time. We saw over the weekend, Bitcoin made the headlines, touching below 20,000, first time since 2020. That just shows you how investors are seeing risk assets right now. Right. So everyone is looking for that hedge, trying to get into some safer uh, investment assets. But at the end of the day, we're seeing no market is actually safe. Right? Safe at no. this point. Nobody, <laughs> nobody, nobody seems safe. to be safe. Let, let's return to the German story, because yeah. now you have a situation where Russia is hitting back right. at all those who it de deems unfriendly. Unfriendly. So that, and that list is fairly long now. It's, it's quite long. Especially in Europe. So, but we're going back to coal fired plants. Yeah. With Germany who had promised that it was closing down. The dirty alternative. Indeed, right. because of environmental reasons. Exactly. So is this a question of, look, uh, That's a luxury we can't really afford. Exactly. They, they're caught between the devil and the deep blue sea at this point because we're seeing uh, Russia actually uh, weaponizing gas, you know, against Europe at this point. They've cut off supplies to a couple of European countries. And the, 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 the painful part is a, 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 a heat wave, an unprecedented heat wave just hit, you know, Europe. And for a heat wave to come at this point, we thought they had time, you know, to the winter, Right. you know, to conserve uh, gas and, you know, reduce, just to reduce reliance on Russian gas. But now we're, we're seeing this heat wave, and with heating, you would require cooling. Absolutely. And that's more, you know, electricity needed in Europe for at this point. For refrigeration and, you know, to cool the environment because we know how uneasy, you know, people get in heat. And with this um, happening at this point, it's going to increase their demand for gas. So they're saying, you know what, we, we cannot um, afford to deplete our gas reserves at this point because we, we, we see they don't want to fund the war in Russia by buying uh, a Russian gas the way they used to. But now they have to actually go back to the coal-fired uh, 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 the, the coal equipment because now they have to fall back to coal to be able to produce electricity so that they can cool their houses because the heat is actually a lot. A We've lot, not indeed. seen this level, you know, in, in many years. And it just, uh, it just goes to show that at this stage, they're trying to wean off Russian gas, but we see elements are trying to push them 
you know, back to uh, Russian gas. But at the end of the day, they're saying, you know what, we have to find a way. We don't have to rely on uh, gas at this point. But at the end of the day, we're seeing this heat is caused by global warming. And going back to a dirty alternative will even worsen we'll, we'll, it. Yeah, we'll make the situation so it, it's worse. Uh, it's a tough it's a tough place to be for for Europe at this point. Now, now, now China's uh, oil imports uh, from uh, Russia <laughs> yeah. uh, have gone way up. Yeah, we know that they've imported more, but now it's it's gone to a record level, a even record surpassing yeah. their previous top supply, which used to be Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Arabia. Yeah, because at the end of the day, they began it at cheap oil you know, from Russia because of the sanctions. So that has, uh, you know, if I can get a cheaper alternative to get my oil, I would move away, you know, Indeed. from the uh, regular suppliers that are using market market uh, rates. So we know Russia is selling cheaper oil uh, to them, and it, it, it was expected that they would actually shift, you know, their supplies to Russia. And we're seeing that happen. We're seeing how the May... Uh, the uh, supplies for May right. went up about over 50%. So at the end of the day, Russia is still selling their oil to friendly uh, nations. And, you know, China is one of them. And China is the biggest importer, you know, of oil, you know, globally. So uh, they're, they're getting their sales. But at the end of the day, we've seen, you know, top economists in Russia say that, okay, fine, you're not selling to the uh, unfriendly nations. But is it... Uh, uh, can this be sustained, you know, just selling to China alone and a few other uh, like friendly India and, and India? And you know, you still need to be able to sell to other countries. So uh, some of the top economists are saying that this is not sustainable. At the end of the day, the Russian economy could be hit by a 10-year recession. That's what some of them are predicting because if you're losing your, your top uh, buyers and... With the way this war is still going, there's still going to be more sanctions. So at the end of the day, we're seeing uh, they're, they're, they're making bank with China, but how sustainable is that? That's the question. Indeed, Laddie. Thank you so much. Of course, we have details of all of this uh, in our business uh, news uh, later on the day, right after this show, and then at 1.30, Laddie Williams in Ichon Mekwa. All the details, all the analysis, the right. breakdown of it for you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. And just before we go, amidst a recent string of mass shootings in the United States, the city of Miami, in collaboration with the Miami-Dade Police Department, held a gun buyback event over the weekend. Earlier, District 2 Commissioner Ken Russell announced the program with a tweet describing the buyback event to support Ukraine and take guns off the streets. Dozens of residents from the city of Miami, Florida, lined up outside City Hall holding their guns. They will be donated to Ukraine through a gun buyback program called Guns for Ukraine, thrown by the local city council. In exchange, residents received a gift card valued at up to $150, depending on the type of gun. The program in total collected 69 guns in four hours, with firearms ranging from AK-47-style assault rifles to fully automatic AR-15S to homemade 3D printed plastic guns. Let's go on that note. Thanks for being with us on this Monday. My name is Ladi Akiri Dunwale. There'll be an update of our stories on the Russian invasion of Ukraine at five o'clock within the world today. For now, to enjoy the rest of your day and working week. Good morning.